Praise the Lord. Today we are going to see about the barren temple, the judgment parable and judgment on the temple. So as you all know that the life of Jesus Christ is divided into eight parts. Now we are in the last part, the last to be crucifixion and resurrection, which happened for seven days. And now you all, this is this, this is the part where Jesus Christ did his ministry. This is a map of Israel. Now he is in the Jerusalem and he is going to finish his ministry here. In Galilee, in Decapoli, in Peraya, Samaria, and Judea, and everywhere he finished the ministry. Now here he is in Jerusalem, where he is going to finish his ministry, his mission by dying on the cross. Now, as you know that, the last seven weeks, the last seven days of his week, as each and every day has a very important ministry for Jesus Christ. The traditional calendar for the events of our last, Lord's last week of ministry look like this. Sunday, triumphal entry into Jerusalem, and Monday there is a cleansing of the temple and the cursing of the fig tree. And the Tuesday, there is a controversy with the Jewish leaders. And in that case, Jesus Christ um, said so many parables also. And the Wednesday, apparently a day of rest. There is nothing recorded about the Jesus ministry on Wednesday. On Thursday, there's preparation for Passover. And then um, and then what happened is the Friday is a trial and crucifixion. And Saturday, Jesus rests in the tomb. And Sunday, Jesus rises from the dead. Um, actually, now we are in previous week, we have finished the Sunday information where the triumphal entry in Jerusalem, we already meditated. Now we are going towards them, the, what happened on the Monday and the Tuesday. And the Tuesday also we are going to see only one information or other information the coming week we can we can meditate. But our main concentration is about the Monday and somewhat something about some Tuesday also. Uh, then let us go to them in detail study. So first is the Sunday, triumphal entry into Jerusalem and then surveying the temple and returning to Bethany. That's what happening in the uh, Sunday also. Because Jesus Christ never stayed inside the Jerusalem. He's staying in Bethany. So maybe people are thinking in Bethany, Mary, Ma Martha, and Lazarus' house was there. Maybe Jesus was uh, staying there. That's what their intention. That's what the, uh, the, um, the theologians are predicting. But um, he never, so he didn't stay in Jerusalem in the night. In the night, he went and stayed in Bethany. And the early morning, he come back to Jerusalem. It is like um, the distance is like some little, little bit, like um, uh, two to three miles. Um, uh, the distance is there. So it is easy for him to travel from Bethany to Jerusalem. Since it is a Passover um, feast time, the Jerusalem is full of people and he never get the place maybe to stay. We don't know why he stayed, but he stayed one in Bethany. So first is a transfer into Jerusalem and then he went to temple. He survived the temple and then returned back to Bethany. You all know that the triumphal entry happened like this. All the people, when Jesus traveled on the court, all the people welcomed him by putting the palm leaf branches on the road and um, uh, waving the branch, bra, 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 branches um, and um, crying unto and shouting, Hosanna, the king of um, the arrival of the, uh, the, the Jewish king inside the Jerusalem. That's what they're happily they are inviting. Jesus here began the process of overturning his messianic servant and proclaimed himself publicly as Messiah. He's going to, for the last seven days, he's going publicly, he's going to proclaim. Yeah, yet Jesus enters Jerusalem in um, humility on a lonely donkey rather than on the war horse to proclaim his messianic intention. By why he's coming on the donkey to proclaim his messianic intention, he never traveled on the donkey. As you all know that, that the first cycle is them well for entering the in the uh, Jerusalem. Uh, Jesus Christ instruct the disciples find a donkey and colt and bring them to Jesus Christ. And they I, they asked why you are taking the colt. Still tell that the Lord need it as a fulfillment of Zechariah nine nine because Zechariah nine nine it is revealed that your king will travel in the donkey and the colt inside the Jerusalem. So fulfill that um, Jesus Christ instruct the disciple to go and bring the donkey and the colt uh, because but he was staying in the Bethpara. And he's asking the disciple to go inside Jerusalem and get the colt and the donkey. And as it is instructed, Jesus Christ, the, the, the disciple went and took the colt and the donkey, the donkey and the colt brought to Jesus Christ. And then Jesus Christ traveled on the uh, colt and then the crowd spread the garments and the branches on the road. And Messiah, acclamation of the crown was also there. The people were shouting and they're calling unto God. And God, um, and they were, um, um, some people were there. And they saw the miracles, what Jesus said. And they also cried, save me, save, we pray. Blessed is the one who comes in the Jehovah name. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our for, um, Father David. And that's what they all shouted. They all praised God. And um, Jesus, um, in, uh, seeing that the Pharisees in the crowd are upset over this proclamation. 
and they tell Jesus, teacher, rebuke your disciples. Why they are shouting like this? Then Jesus replied, I tell you, if this uh, remained silent, the stone would cry out. So all the disciples, all the people are crying out and shouting about Hosanna, Hosanna. As the custom uh, when visiting Jerusalem, Jesus goes to the temple to teach, then he cured the blind and the lame. So after this entry, after all this uh, shouting and um, uh, worshipping and uh, shouting like Hosanna, Hosanna, and the um, uh, arrival of the um, save, save, we pray. Hosanna means save. We pray that blessed is the one who coming in Jehovah's name. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. That's um, that, that's what they shouted. Um, they, they shouted Hosanna. Hosanna means save. Please come and save. That's what that's what the person. Hosanna means save. We pray. We are praying that please come and save us. That's what they shouted. After this is over, um, Jesus Christ um, went to Jerusalem temple and um, there he gave some teaching and then he cured the blind and the lame people there. Now he is going to finish his ministry. Maybe this is the last uh, healing he is doing. When the chief priests and the scribes see what he is doing and hear the boys in the temple cry out, save me, save we pray. That is Hosanna, the son of David. They became angry. The children also, the boys also shouting what they are shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna, the son of David. They became angry. Who chief priest him? Even the religious leader asked Jesus, do you hear what these are saying? Jesus replied, did you never read this? Out of the mouth of the children and infants, you have brought forth praise. That is them as revealed in um, Psalms uh, chapter 5. So th this is what is happening now. Why are you interrupting now? Let the children shout, um, Hosanna, Hosanna, the son of David. Jesus looks around upon the things in the temple. It is now late. So he leaves with the apostle. Now after they were um, seeing the inspection of the temple, he just inspected the temple. He traveled back to Bethany, where they spent night in the uh, Bethany, maybe in the Mary Martha Lazarus house. So Sunday is over. Now the Sunday he entered, he, he visited the temple. Then he gave some little teaching. He cured the people who are lame and who are lame and blind. And uh, after that, uh, the, the, the boys are also shouting. And he made a little inspection there. He returned back to Bethany. That's over on Sunday. And what happened on the Monday? On the Monday, he's going to travel. Three things are, are going to happen. Fig tree cursing is going to happen. And then cleansing the temple, the attraction of the sacrifice. Who is the sacrifice here? Jesus Christ. So the people, especially the Gentile people, are going to be attracted towards Jesus Christ. Then again, he is returned to Bethany. This is going to happen on Monday. Here we're concentrating this study on Mark chapter 11. And uh, attraction of the sacrifice on the John chapter 12. So let us see that the fig tree cursing. Now let us see about fig, fig tree cursing. Now early morning, uh, on the Monday, they, they were traveling towards Jerusalem. Jesus is hungry. Now from Bethany to Jerusalem, they are walking towards that Jerusalem. From Bethany to Jerusalem, Jesus is hungry. So when he see a fig tree, he walks towards it. Does it have figs? He went and saw. It is not. Uh, it is now only late March. The time is only the March. But the season for fig is not is until June. Uh, only in the June month, you can see the uh, fig fruits there. Still, the leaves are out and having sprouted yearly. The leaves are there. Uh, thus, Jesus feels that that might be yearly figs. There are two types of figs. Yearly figs are there and the ripened figs are there. But um, even the yearly figs are edible. The, the, the people can eat that also. So, Jesus wants to see since the tree is full of leaves, it may have some yearly figs. We find though there was none, but that was no, 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 no fruits were there, nothing, only leaves are there. The leaves have given the tree a deception. From the back, from the long side, if you see, oh, the tree is full of leaves. Maybe the yearly figs may be there. That's what somebody will think. But this year, this tree gives a deception, the deceptive appearance. Jesus then says, let no one eat fruit from you, even again. From that time onwards, the 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 the, uh, the tree started to wither. See, the, now Jesus did a, uh, a curse the fig tree. What he cursed? Let no one eat fruit from you ever again. Nothing is going to finish. That's what this. It's so astonishing. Oh, see, this is not even time for 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 the fig tree to give the fruit. fruit. Um, only um, yearly fig uh, fruits may be there. Even then, there is no fruit. Um, and so Jesus cursed them. Um, after the fig harvest from mid August to mid October, the branches of fig trees sprout. Um, that remains undeveloped throughout the winter. They may have, see, it will develop only through the winter, but uh, there is going to be a sprout is coming out of it. These buds smell into sm small uh, garden no no known as in Hebrew as a pam pagim. So this small sprout we call it as a pagim. It is a developed one, we call it as a fig fruit, and the small sprouted one, they call it as a pagim, uh, that will appear in the March and April. 
but the full uh, developed one will appear only in the mid October August to mid October. But the sprout we we'll call it as a pageum will start out to appear in the tree in the March and April itself. Uh, and um, by the sprouting of leaf, buds and some branches usually in the April. So when the, there will be more uh, leaves will come out um, and some buds of also small branches also come out and in the small branches small buds will come out. These buds we call it as a pageum. This will appear early in the April itself. Now he is searching for the at the end of the March. The fig tree does produce fig knobs before it produces leaves. First of all, what happened? Only the knobs will come out, then the leaves will count. Once the fig tree is a leaf one, therefore you expect to find branches loaded with the pageum. So how the how fig tree grows? First is the fig tree at the by, by the April or the something like that, um, the sprout will come. And then that um, buds will come, the knobs non, non, will come, that we call as a pageant. And uh, once the pageant comes, then what the leaves will produce them. So the, the, this fig tree is full of leaves, um, then it should have the pageant. That is a yearly uh, fig, um, fig fruits, um, not a matured one, yearly one, that we call as a pageant. So uh, once a fig tree is in leaf, um, one therefore expect to find branches loaded with the pageant in various stage of maturation. It may be various stage, but it is edible. Jesus, after seeing a fig tree full of leaves, um, turned aside in hope of finding something edible. In the spring of the year, the pageum are, of course, not yet um, ripened into the mature summer fig, but they can be eaten. That's the thing. That's why Jesus went. Um, the tree will turn out of the deception, for it is green. In for green in look, but when Jesus inspected it, he find no pageant. See now here also Jesus inspecting the fig tree. First of all, in the Sunday, Jesus went to Jerusalem, then he inspected the temple. Now he is inspecting the fig tree, whether he has some yearly fig fruits. It is a tree with a sign of fruit, but with no fruit. How it is sign? Well, how you think that if the tree is full of sign of fruit? Because more leaves are there. First pageant will come, then only leaves will come. Now the leaves have more, that means each branch should be loaded with the pageant, but only leaves are there, no um, pageant is there. The more puzzling part of the brief narration of the cursing of the fig, why Jesus cursed the fig? Because the prophet had often used the fig tree as a symbol of the judgment. So in Old Testament days, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Hosea, Joel, and Micah all represented fig tree as a symbol of judgment. So now Jesus Christ is going to pronounce judgment on the Jerusalem, on the Jerusalem temple. So now since the people, even though Jesus did ministry for three and a half years, nobody accepts Jesus as a Messiah. Now this is a time for them to be to pronounce judgment. So for that, pictorially, now Jesus is cursing the fig tree. Even though the fig tree appears to have greeny leaves, but there is no pageant. Even though it looked like it's going to have the yearly fig trees, but in deception, there is no fig fruits. Um, the leafy fig tree, with all its promises of fruit, uh, is a deceptive as a temple, which despite its religious commerce and activity, it really hide out nothing. So he went and searched the temple also. He already inspected what is wrong happening there. You know what is happening there. So in the same way, the people are expecting people worship there and, they, and the God's presence will be there. That's what the people expectation of the temple. But what happened is all wrong things are happening the same way. They look, the tree looks like a so greeny pasture and the people expect it will have the pageant, but it has nothing is there. So the curse of the fig tree is a symbol of God's judgment on the temple. So this is first of all the cursing of the fig tree. Now let us go to the cleansing the temple. After cursing the fig tree, Jesus Christ again go to the temple. What's going to happen there? Let us see that. Well, Jesus is going to cleanse the temple. Can you see here? He's um, uh, putting upside down the table where they're exchanging the coin and their dough is there and the marketplace is there and all the people are buying and selling. Someone, some person is also giving money and buying something also. Everything is happening there, but Jesus is putting up everything upside down. That we call it cleansing the temple. Before long, Jesus and his disciples reach Jerusalem. He, he goes to the temple. When he inspected the previous afternoon itself, that Sunday afternoon itself, he inspected. Now he is going again to the temple. Today he does more than inspection. He acts like what he did three years earlier at the Passover, that is 30 Sigim. Three years before, Jesus Christ cleansed the temple. That is there in John chapter. Again, after three years, again also he is going to do the same thing. He is going to cleanse the temple. This time Jesus throw out those selling and buying in the temple. Everything he is going to throw out. He also overturned the table of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves. This is all going to happen now. Okay, everything is happening now. Jesus is cleansing. 
cleansing the temple. Now we can know why Jesus is cleansing the temple. What is happening there? So he does not even let anyone carrying things to any another part of the city. Takes a shortcut through the temple courtyard. Most of the people, it's a big temple yard. So when they cross them and go to other side of the, the, of the city, they'll cross through the temple and carry the things. That also he is stopping. He says, it, it is not written, my house will be called house of prayer for all the nation, but you have made it a cave of robbers. When, it should be a house of prayer, but it turned into the cave of robbers. Um, so can you see here, house of prayer is where the people gathered together to pray. Now here they are, the thieves are hiding and it became a cave for the robbers. Um, his reason for calling these men robbers is that they demand an um, extraordinary price from those who have to buy animals needed for sacrifice. You all know that uh, this is a Passover feast in a time. During the Passover feast, it is written in the Old Testament, in the Moses law, everybody has to sacrifice the Passover lamp. For that Passover lamp, they have to buy the Passover lamp. The people who are traveling from the long distance, like from Galilee, from Pariah, all this distance are very long. They cannot take the cattle along with them because it cannot walk long, walk long distance, isn't it? So they have to buy from the place in Jerusalem, in and around Jerusalem only. Now they are selling in the temple itself, but the price price of the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the sacrifice animal is very high. No other way, they have to buy it. So by that, they are cheating the people. Jesus viewed this dealing as an extortion or robbery. Now you are taking excess money from people. That means you are robbing money from the people because they have to pay the sacrifice. But for that sacrifice animal, they are um, giving more money than the normal amount. Um, here, Herod Temple, let us go see about Herod Temple. Herod Temple is the Israel's third temple. It is first temple was the Solomon Temple. Second temple was Zerubbabel Temple. Now, Herod Temple is the is expansion of the Zerubbabel Temple. And we call it the third temple also. Was still under the construction of Jesus' days, having been begun in 20 BC. Now, the time is uh, uh, AD 32, but it has started to build by 20 BC. So, they were building the, the this uh, third temple for more than 60 years. The construction is still going on. The temple consists of four divisions and of immense and, uh, and property. It is a very big property and it has four divisions. The temple has four divisions. First and the largest division was the court of the Gentile and open air um, um, uh, quadrangle measuring around 500 yards long by 325 yards which is 35 acres um, and enclosed a por porch, um, portico supported by rows of columns. So it is a beautiful one. It's a very big one. It is a comprising of more than three to four football grounds. Um, can you see how big it is? Uh, most part of the Jerusalem is covered with this uh, temple, such a big one. Even the, the, it has four parts. Uh, the first part is the first, first larger part is a Gentile court where the Gentile people can stay and pray. Uh, beyond that, the Gentiles are not allowed. Only Jewish people are allowed. The first is a Gentile court. The area of the Gentile court, um, 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 uh, the, the, since um, it is a very large court, um, full of porticos and columns. Um, there, what happened? The merchants sold sheep and dove for sacrifice and exchange foreign currency um, into the uh, Syrian shekel, the closest available currency to the Hebrew shekel, commanded in Exodus 30. Can you see here? Now only this place is very big, and this is a gentile court. Um, and um, and the uh, and so the merchants collect the sheep and dough there, and they started to sell that uh, uh, for sacrifice uh, and they exchange foreign currency also. The foreign currency is nothing but the Syrian uh, silver currency. Uh, the, the people are traveling from different countries. Um, they may have the different different currencies. Um, on the currency, they may be uh, engraved with the other king's name, other king's faces, um, or any idol faces. Uh, that uh, currency is not allowed into the temple. They want the temple currency should be pure. So every uh, currency is other than the Hebrew shekel has to be uh, changed to the Hebrew shekel. The Hebrew shekel is made up of um, the uh, Syrian shekel and it's nothing but um, a pure pure silver made up. So they call the Syrian shekel as Hebrew shekel. So whatever may be the coin, they have to exchange it. After exchanging and they with that money, they have to buy the Sacrificial animal. So can you see here, during the exchange also, the exchange rate is going to be very high. There they'll get more money. After that, to buy the sacrificial animal also, it was very costly. In all ways, they are extracting money from the people. That, that means robbery. The immense volume of trade and exchange in the court of the Gentile was crucial, not only for maintenance of proper worship, but also for the financial gain of the Sadducees and Sanhedrin. Here, the excess money, the market people, the sellers are getting, no, each, each 
each each sellers are getting excess money now the excess money they have to give certain percentage of money to sadhusis and sanharadin group sanharadin has 72 members and so separate money is going for them also this we called as a commission money so this is also going all these things are very bad the other three divisions of the temple are the court of the woman the court of the israel so where only circumcised jewish male can go then the holy of holies belonged within the sanctuary so four division first division is the court of gentiles where the the merchants sold, so selling their sheep and dove for sacrifice and they are exchanging foreign currency and the next one is the women court where only women are allowed until that court and the next is the, the court of israel where the circumcised jewish males are allowed and last one is the holy of holies only the high priest and priest are allowed there so this is what the temple looks like um, now the sanctuary was separated from the court of the gentile by a wall now the gentile people are not allowed beyond the gentile court um, and there is a wall uh, to separate them they call they call the wall a wall as a sorak um, and on the sorak there was um, um uh, there was a warning was posted which was written in greek latin and arabic what it was a warning written no foreigners that is gentile may enter within the railing or enclosed the enclosure that surrounds the temple this is the place until this only the gentile people can stay if they are going to cross beyond this wall then they are going to be killed and if they are going to be killed don't blame anybody you are going to be killed because of your action that was written in greek in latin and arabic the court of the gentile was a vital stock market of animal dealers and money changers all of whom were necessary to ensure proper sacrifice and offering for the many pilgrims especially at festival to the temple in righteous indignation in righteous agony jesus drives the animal dealers from the temple and overturns the table of money changers that's what jesus did then jesus taught them by saying after doing the jesus said scripture says my house will be called the house of prayer but you have turned it into the gathering place of thieves the reference to this house of prayer for all nations comes from jesus took this references from isaiah chapter 56 7 the isaiah 56 speaks of the extension of the god salvation to the people who formerly excluded them before the people only the israel people are included in the temple can you see here until only the gentile uh, gentile court only until the gentile gentiles are allowed beyond that they cannot go uh, beyond that is a woman court and then after a woman court there is a male court after that is the holy of holies only gentile can stay until that court they are not allowed beyond that time. but what the isaiah 56 but um, jesus can quote this from the isaiah 56 what the isaiah 56 says my house will be called the house of prayer but you have turned it into the gathering prayer of thieves um, isaiah 56 um, um, speaks of the extension of the god's salvation not only the jewish people it is extended beyond the foreigners unique exiles and gentiles all for all people salvation is extended that's what isaiah 56 says uh, the temple and the covenant are not reserved exclusively for israel but including all nations um, that's what um, um uh, the uh, isaiah the isaiah 56 13 10 says uh, the temple is not the sole property of israel but a witness to the nation the place where everyone who loves the name of the lord uh, worship him a place where god will gather still others not only you are telling that Uh, the gentile people are not, not allowed beyond that uh, court uh, that uh, that gate uh, we call that gate as a uh, that gate we call it as a, um, uh, that uh, wall we call it as a sorak so only until that wall sorak the uh, gentiles are allowed if they if they, if they cross the sorak uh, they may be killed but now jesus christ is telling this uh, temple is going to be salvation is going to be extended beyond all the foreigners all the gentiles all the unish were all are now going to be saved the temple is not only the sole property of israel but all the other people uh, who loves the name of the lord they can come and worship him a place where god will gather still others when the chief priests and expert in moses teaching heard him they looked for a way to kill him and they saw that what jesus did he overturned the table because um, this um, gentile court is um, watched by the sanhedrin group Uh, uh, high priest and sadducees uh, all these uh, religious leaders when he overturned the table and sent everybody out uh, they came to know that very easily so they got very angry they are going to look for him to kill him they, but they were afraid to kill him because um, there were so many people are crowd of people are amazed and hearing this teaching around him so they are uh, they are not able to catch him on that day to kill him so now is the attraction of the sacrifice now next is what after this overturning that's going to something is going to happen that is attraction of sacrifice then he, then jesus christ returned to bethany what is attraction of sacrifice let us see that um, 
uh, no, not only uh, the uh, Jewish, but also proselytes convert to Jesus' religion have come for the Passover. This Passover not only for Jewish people and for Gentiles who accept the uh, Jehovah God as a true God and who convert to the Judaism also coming to for, for, to, to take take part in the Passover feast. So, so many Greek speaking people are there, all other language people who are not Jewish people, but they belong to other race, but they became a believer of Jehovah. So those people we called as a proselytes. They are called as a proselytes. And those people are also there in Jerusalem. Among them are the Greeks who have come to worship at the feast. There are some Greek people are there. They are proselytes. They are not belong to the Jewish, um, the, to the race of Jewish uh, Israel people, but they are Greek Greek speaking people. They approach Philip and those Gentile people who accept Jesus, uh, who accept Jehovah as a God. Those proselytes approach Philip. Who is Philip? Philip is one of the disciples of Jesus Christ. Um, because they thought uh, Philip is a Greek name, so they might have approached him. Because Greek, no? Greek name, maybe they thought he's a Greek. So let it go and talk to him and ask him to see Jesus. They went and said, we want to see Jesus Christ. Um, so Philip may be unsure whether such a meeting is appropriate. He don't know whether is it correct to take these uh, people to Jesus Christ. He has no idea. So he, uh, he went and said this to Andrew. But uh, both Andrew and Philip, take the matter to Jesus Christ, who is part of, apparently still at the temple. Now still is at the temple. Now is uh, Andrew and Philip taking this information that some of the Greeks who are, who are proselytes, who came to Jerusalem uh, to take part in the Passover feast, they want to see you. That's what is going to happen. And then Jesus knows uh, what is going to happen in a few days. So this is not the time to satisfy people's curiosity or to seek popularity. So the problem is that uh, something is going to happen within a few days. Um, what's going to happen? He's going to die on the cross. Uh, so this is not the time to satisfy people's curiosity. With the curiosity, they are coming and asking. And, uh, and this is not a time to seek popularity. And moreover, even though if you see them, nothing is going to happen. Because once you die on the cross one day, then one day the salvation is going to come to the Gentile people. Then it is who's going to be useful. So he responded to the two apostles with an illustration. Now, he, whether he said no, yes or no, we don't know. But he started to give illustration to the two apostles. The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Now the time has come. The Son of Man is going to, to be glorified by dying on the cross. On the cross, more truly I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains just one grain. But if it dies, it then bears much fruit. See, the disciples are coming and asking, see, if the Greek people want to see you, whether you have to say yes or no. He didn't say anything uh, for, for that question. But instead of that, he started to give illustration to the disciple. What was the illustration? The hour has come. I am going to die. I am going to be glorified. Since I am going to be die, I am going to die. I am going. I am going to compare my death as a uh, as a uh, as a only one wheat which fall on the ground. Once the grain fall on the ground, it dies and it produces more grains and it bear more fruit. In the same way, what's going to happen? One grain of wheat might seem of little value, yet if it's put into the soil and dies as a seed, it can germinate and in time grows into a product stalk with many grains. So that's what's going to happen now. He's going to illustration himself as a one grain, one wheat grain, and it is useless when it is um, alive, when it is not uh, dead in the soil. Once he fell in the uh, soil, once it has died, it will, it will make, um, it will produce a stalk with many grains. Um, in that way, what is going to happen is that Jesus Christ is telling that um, similarly, Jesus is one perfect man, still by his being faithful to God till his death, he will, he will become the means of imparting everlasting life to many who has a similar spirit of self-sacrifice. So that just Jesus said, whoever is fond of this life, destroy it. But whoever hates his life in this world will satisfy, safeguard it for everlasting life. So Jesus Christ was a um, completely a perfect man who fulfilled uh, God's will until his death. Um, and he's going to die as a wheat um, fell in the ground and die the same way the people who are going to be faithful until that death them um, is going to impart the everlasting life to them. And those people are going to receive the everlasting life. Uh, that's what Jesus Christ is telling. And Jesus is not thinking of himself only for he says, anyone who serves me must follow me. And where I am, my servant will also be there. My father will honor the one who serves me. So many information now Jesus is giving to them. He's telling that I am going to die because of that. People who are going to be faithful unto their life are going to get the everlasting life. And where I am, the people who serve me are going to be there. 
and those people father will honor them those honored by the father will become christ associated with the kingdom now bearing in the mind the great sacrifice and agonizing death that that avoids him jesus says my soul is troubled what should i say father keep me from having to go through with this no this is not very recent i have come to this point in my life so jesus christ very well know he's going to die on the cross so his soul is now troubling so here also but jesus does not want to avoid accomplishing god's will but he still let god's will as i am coming to this hour let this happen to me jesus agree with all the god as purpose them including one sacrificial death them so for for the disciples them to come and ask him whether they jesus christ allowed the greeks to come and see him instead of answering their question jesus christ illustrated about uh, the about the green the, the wheat um, one wheat seed um, and it also illustrated about um, about his death and um, all these things we have illustrated after that what happened is that um, and then uh, the, then the jewish people heard the guy's voice um, the people hearing all the people are in the, in the temple can you see here this is the temple court where all the jewish people also there they hear the god's voice from the heaven what's going to happen i'll tell you the jews hear the god's voice at the temple on monday jesus is speaking about his approaching death can you see here he's telling that i'm going to die jesus says father glorify your name the mighty voice from the heaven says respond i have glorified it and i will glorify it glorified again immediately a mighty voice heard from the heaven can you see here in the temple all the people were astonished why jesus christ said um, father glorify your name because he is he is know very well about his approaching death that's why jesus christ said like this the people nearby were astonished they were afraid something they were heard thunder other says an angel has spoken to him however it is jagawa whom they just heard speaking who was hearing the father god was hearing they were speaking to them so they are gathering the temple they hear the voice from the heaven when the father god is talking to them and and they were astonished and this is not the first time that human have heard a god's voice in connection with jesus because three and a half years ago as jesus baptism john the baptist heard god saying to jesus uh, saying of so saying about jesus christ this is my son the beloved whom i have approved so this is what voice jesus baptized john the baptist heard when jesus took the baptism this voice came from the heaven this is my son my beloved whom i have approved then later after um, um they do uh, after the 30 years that is 32 ce jesus was transfigured before james john and peter you know that uh, during the ministry jesus took james john and peter to the um, hey, hey, um, um, to the tall mount up mountain there he um, transfigured and during the transfiguration the three men heard god declaration what god declared to them this is my son the beloved whom i have approved listen to him that is what is what is telling listen to him listen to him. first is this is my son whom i have approved during the birth of during the baptism of jesus christ uh, john the baptist heard but during the transfiguration mountain the three, the three disciple heard this time the jehovah god the father god told this is my son the beloved whom i have approved listen to him that's what is important but now this third time jehovah is speaking in a way that many can hear all are hearing this time uh, the, now jesus says this voice has occurred not for my sake but for your sake what voice what here glorify me my lord that's what jesus christ said and mighty voice here i have glorified it and and will glorify it again jesus jehovah god told i already glorified you jesus my son i am still going to glorify you this was the voice here and jesus christ is telling this is voice has occurred not for me that's for your sake it is proof that uh, he is truly the god son the foretold messiah now the voice from the heaven is very clearly telling all the people who gathered in the temple jesus christ is messiah but moreover jesus faithful life course but both exemplifies the way human should live and confirm that certain the devil the ruler of world deserve to be executed the entire life jesus christ ministry clearly revealed that satan is the one who has to be executed that's why jesus said now it is a time for the world to be judged now the prince of this world will be thrown out now he is telling the my entire ministry in the earth i was um, doing all the ministry against the work of satan now the time has come for the world to be judged now the prince of this world which is the satan will be thrown out that's going to happen rather than being a defeat jesus christ um, approaches his death with with a great smile and with uh, that that will be a great victory he explains i am going to be lifted up from the earth when i am i will bring all people to myself jesus christ telling i am going to be lifted up on the cross on the earth so on seeing that 
all the people are, are going to bring to, towards myself because I'm going to be lifted on the cross. He said this to show them how he was going to die. He's going to be lifted on the uh, cross. Um, by, uh, by, uh, by, by that time, um, so many people are going to come towards Christ, uh, accept Jesus as a Messiah. By his death, Jesus will draw others to himself, uh, opening the way to the everlasting life. Um, so by his death, by my death, I'm going to draw other people towards myself and giving them and opening the way to the everlasting life because Jesus is the way, truth, and the life. In response to this, the, the crowd of people said that they lost, the, the, the most of laws say that Messiah will remain forever. But how come you are saying the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is the Son of Man? Again, they are asking. The law of Moses said, Messiah is going to live forever. But you are telling that Son of Man must be lifted up. Who is that Son of Man? Despite all evidence, including hearing God's own voice, most of them do not accept Jesus as a true son of man, the promised Messiah. Even they hear the voice, even after that also, they are not accepting Jesus as a son of man. Looking back of Jesus' ministry, prophecy were being fulfilled when Jews did not put faith in him. Because even though so many, many miracles Jesus did, Jewish people, Jewish people did not put faith on Jesus as a Messiah. So already Isaiah foretold that the eyes of the people would be blinded and their hearts would be hard so that they would not turn around to be healed. Already Isaiah revealed in the prophecy itself that um, even though the Messiah come and talk to you, your eyes are going to be uh, blinded. Your spiritual eyes are going to be blinded and your hearts are so hard that you never accept them and would turn away from the sin. That's what Isaiah chapter 6, 10 and 6, 10 says. Um, so it is already revealed. Now it is happening. Jesus cried out and said, Whoever believe in me does not does not believe in me only. They also believe in the one who sent me. That's why Jesus cried out. Now at last in the temple, he's crying out and telling, I don't come to judge the world. I came to serve the world. But there is a judge for anyone who does not accept me and my words. Those words I have spoken will judge them on the last day. Then I'm not going to judge. Only the word I have spoken is going to judge you on the last day. Leaving Jerusalem on Monday afternoon, Jesus returned to bed and after doing or saying all these things Jesus Christ left the temple and he left the Jerusalem on the Monday afternoon itself and Jesus returned to Bethany um, uh, then he likely spent the night at the home of his friends Martha, Ma, Mary and Lazarus. Again this one too, Monday is over and the Monday Jesus Christ clearly revealed that I am going to be lifted up by lifting up so I am going to draw more people towards me so that what happened and they hear the voice from heaven. Jehovah God talked directly to the people. Even go, all these things happen. They never accept Jesus as a Messiah. With this thing, the Monday uh, work is over. Even in the afternoon itself, Jesus Christ returned to Bethany and might have stayed in the Mary, Martha and Lazarus house. Let us go to the Tuesday. What happened going to the Tuesday? Because already um, while entering into the Jerusalem, Jesus Christ, uh, cursed is the fig tree, isn't it? Now let us go what is going to happen now in the Tuesday also. Then they returned back. They stayed the full night. Monday night is over. The Tuesday morning, again, Jesus Christ is going to travel from Bethany to Jerusalem. And then what is going to happen? Judgment parable, withering the fig tree testifies. Now, already the, the, the fig tree was withered. That is going to testify something. What is going to testify? Let us see that. That we call it a judgment parable. Already the temple was judgmented, isn't it? The, the, the judgment on the temple was pronounced by Jesus Christ. Now there's a judgment parable because Jesus Christ searched for a um, yearly fig trees, fig fruit from the uh, uh, from the greeny, uh, green leaf, leaf filled fig tree, but he didn't find anything. So in the same way, Jesus Christ inspected the temple and found anything good over there. Nothing he found. Then he cleansed the temple and that is called the, the, the judgment on the temple. And again, he stayed back. He went back again uh, on the stayed night. On the Monday night, he stayed in the Mary Martha Lazarus house. And the Monday is over. Again, Tuesday, he's returning back to Jerusalem. On the way, what is going to happen? That we are going to see. That we call the judgment parable. Withering fig tree testifies. Mark chapter 11. While they are coming or uh, traveling towards Jerusalem, Peter saw that the, that the tree what Jesus Christ cursed was already uh, withered. So he was there. all the disciples were very astonished to see that. Can you see here, not even a single green leaves are there. Everything was burnt look like. Everything is withered. Before it was fully green, but only leaves are there. No yearly fig fruits are there. And now the, nothing is there. Fully it is withered. Let us see what's going to happen. Now in the morning, Jesus and his disciples are on the road again. 
him about walking towards the Jerusalem um, where they were, where they want to go to temple, um, where they want to go to temple. And as the final day of his public ministry, before he celebrated the Passover, he stood to the memories of memories of death and the face of the trial and execution. And then, and on the way to Bethany, over the Mount of Olives, towards Jerusalem, Peter noticed the tree that Jesus cursed the previous morning. And he noticed uh, the tree what Jesus Christ cursed the previous morning. And the which morning he cursed? And the Monday morning Jesus Christ cursed. Now on the Tuesday morning, Peter is seeing that. So he said to Jesus, Rabbi, look, the fig tree you cursed has dried up. Everything is dried up. So from this, what the lesson we know, they like the fig tree, the nation of Israel has a deceptive appearance. First is what? What's the parable from, we are learning from this parable? The parable is of Jesus Christ telling that like the fig tree, um, which was, which has no fruit, the same way the, the nation of Israel has a deceptive appearance. The people of this nation are in covenant relationship with God and they might outwardly appear to observe his law. It looked like all the people are gathering you know, during the feast of Passover. More than 1 million people are there. Maybe I'm sorry. More, more than um, uh, 22, 20, 25 lakhs of people are gathered in Jerusalem. So they want to celebrate the feast. They want to fulfill the law of Moses, what to do on the day of um, Passover. Everybody seems to be so religious. Outwardly, they are observing the law. It looked like so they are like a green fig tree. And inside, if you go and inspect them, like the fig tree, it has no yearly fig fruit. This, fig, this people has no fruit also. The people of this nation, the people of Israel are in the covenant relationship with God and they might outwardly appear to observe Islam. And however, the nation as a whole has proved to be both lacking faith and barren of good fruitage. They even reject God's own son. They rejected God's own son. They are lacking faith. And nothing no, more, no good fruits are there. The people are full of sin, but they are coming to the temple, doing the sacrifice. Again, go back and do the same sin. So nothing is good. Hence, by causing the unproductive fig tree to wither, hence by cursing the unproductive fig tree to dry, Jesus Christ demonstrated the end um, will be the fruitless, uh, faithless nation. What will be the end? So what happened to the fig tree is going to happen to the Jerusalem and the people of Israel. The, the fig tree was dried up the same way the Jerusalem and the Jerusalem temple are going to be completely destroyed in, in, in the coming days. Um, it is going to have the same thing what's going to have what happened to fig tree. And this is the parable. Why? Because uh, even though they are the common relationship with the God, uh, even though they observe the laws outwardly, in the in, inwardly, they lack faith. Um, uh, they bear no good fruit. Um, they even rejected God's own son. So what happened to fig tree is certainly going to happen to the tree, uh, to, the, uh, to the temple and the Jerusalem. This exactly happened at the AD 70. And what Jesus said has happened, the, the Roman government, the Roman army, totally destroyed Jerusalem and completely burnt the uh, Herod temple. Not even a stone over, a stone was even there. Everything was demolished um, and uh, more than um, lakhs of people were killed. Um, even uh, the pregnant lady's uh, womb was uh, opened and the child was taken from the womb and they were killed and they smashed on the uh, rock and they were killed cruelly and all uh, limbs were cut off and all the head were cut off. Uh, terrible death. So many people died and so many people took us a captive and so many people ran all over the world that we called as a diaspora. This happened in AD 17. That's what Jesus Christ is telling. What happened to the fig tree is going to happen to Jerusalem and also temple inside the Jerusalem because um, they have proved to be lack of uh, having faith. Um, they have proved to be uh, producing bad fruit um, and full of sin and they are also rejected the God's own son, Jesus Christ, the Messiah. So, hence, by causing the unproductive, by cursing the unproductive tree to wither, Jesus Christ demonstrates what the end will be for this fruitless, faithless nation. And then, the, not only that, first lesson is about uh, comparing uh, the, uh, the the dry the, the withering of fig tree and the appearance of the fig tree with the deceptive appearance of the uh, people of uh, the Jewish people. First, uh, is the first is the parable comparison. The next one is that uh, Jesus provides an object lesson of the on the need of the having faith in God. The first thing is a, is a is a prediction what's going to happen to the temple and also to the Jerusalem. Next is a lesson about the disciples should have faith in God. 
with this um, um, uh, fig tree, Jesus Christ's teachings, disciples, another important lesson that they need to have faith in God. Jesus said to the disciples, have faith in God. I can guarantee this truth. This, this is the, this what will be done for someone who does not doubt but believe what he says will happen. He can say to this mountain, be uprooted and thrown into the sea and it will be done for him. That's why I tell you to have faith that you have already received whatever you pray for and it will be yours. Whatever you pray, uh, forgive anything. Uh, whenever you pray, forgive anything you have against anyone. Then your father in heaven will forgive your failure. So this is very, very important. First about faith. The next about prayer. Third about this forgiveness. So the three things where Jesus Christ is telling along with them, uh, with, the, uh, uh, with the incident of the uh, dried fig tree. So the dried fig tree, one incident is that like the fig tree dried, like the judgment came upon the um, deceptive fig tree, the same judgment is going to come upon the deceptive Jerusalem, the deceptive temple, the deceptive people of Israel. So one, one lesson is over. The other lesson is the disciples should, should have uh, faith in God because they are going to face a very tough situation in their life. Um, so what much of faith they should have? They asked how Jesus Christ, when he said this is withered, Jesus Christ said, have faith in God. I can guarantee this truth. This is what will be done for someone who does not doubt but believe. You should not doubt but believe what I did to the tree, you can also do. You can say that uh, your mountain, you go away from this, immediately the mountain will be uprooted and thrown into the sea. And it will be done because with faith you have commanded. That's why I will tell you to have faith when you have already received whatever you pray for and it will be yours. Now next is a prayer. First one is a faith and next is a prayer. What is a prayer? If you if you pray and say that God, we have already have received, that means you are going to be receive it because you already confessed that you have received it. And next one, whenever you pray, forgive anything you have anything against anybody. Another, then your father in heaven will forgive your failure. So, what an important lesson for all the Jew, Jesus followers. It is especially appropriate for the apostles in view of the difficult testers they will soon face because all the apostles are going to die, martyr are going to. Um, killed, they are going to mother, they are going to die as a martyr, except uh, John the disciple. All the people are going to die as a martyr. They should have faith in God, even the toughest situation. So this was a lesson taught by Jesus Christ. The fig tree uh, temple episode concluded with the saying on faith, the power of prayer and necessity of forgiveness. So the fig tree temple episode, what we call it the episode, fig tree temple episode, how it is going to end by the saying of, the concluded with the saying on Faith, the power of prayer, and necessity of forgiveness. The withered, the dried fig tree is an object lesson to the disciple to have faith in God. What is the object lesson? The object lesson for the disciple is to have faith in God. What is the object lesson for the, uh, the Jewish people? The object lesson is that as the fig tree dried, the temple is going to be destroyed and the Jewish people are going to be demolished and the entire Jerusalem is going to be burnt. That's the object lesson for the Jewish people. And what's the object lesson for the, um, the fig tree temple episode? For the, the, the disciples, the object lesson is saying on faith, the power of prayer and necessity of forgiveness. Faith is opposite of doubting in one's heart. What is faith? It is opposite of doubting in one's heart. Faith is also opposite of fear. It is a choice to trust the Jesus despite everything to the contrary. Everything seems to be contrary. Despite that, you have to have trust in Jesus Christ and to expect from him what cannot be expected from anything else in the world. So you are going to expect something from Jesus Christ, which you cannot ex expect anything from the world, but you can expect from Jesus Christ. Even though it seems to be a contrary for everything, but you certainly trust in Jesus Christ that we call it as a faith. There is a connection between faith and the prayer because faith believers uh, enough to ask, faith believes enough to ask, um, and asking is rooted in the conviction that God's intention is this. Will God's intention will be done on the earth as it is in the heaven? Because it is written in Matthew 6:10, all you have when you pray, let uh, let your will be done in the earth um, as it is done in the heaven. That's what we have to pray, isn't it? The same way. So our faith believes enough to ask. Or unless otherwise you have faith, you never pray. So if you are praying, means 
you are having the faith and not only that your faith is rooted in the conviction what is the conviction god want to do one thing what is uh, god's will is taken place in the heaven it it also going to take in place in the earth so if we have to take it place in the earth the prayer what i am praying should have to be answered that should be our faith that should be our prayer the final instruction is about forgiveness of sin which is a feature of faith that most perfectly reflects god's nature if you don't have faith you won't forget the people and forgive them so faith is very important faith is opposite to doubting faith is opposite to fear and it expect them and anything from uh, lord god jesus christ which you cannot expect from the world and faith and prayer are interconnected without faith you cannot pray if you pray that means you have faith you pray in a such a way let's god's will be taken in your life that will certainly take place and third one for third one is forgiveness of sin unless otherwise you forgive sin you are not you don't have faith if you have faith certainly you forgive sin of the other people because it reflects god's nature let us see the application point so we are going to finish now with the application point today we are going to see is a faith so because you know judgment of a, a temple judgment parable using the fig tree so the fig tree par the temple concept all thing end with a, with a, with a picture a lesson to the disciple that you should have faith so what about your faith how to the growth how should be the growth of faith in christian life and how your growth of faith should be in christian life in six ways a growth of faith in the christian life should reflect first one is you stand fast in faith first corinthians 16 30 said be alert be firm in the christian faith be encouraged and strong so this you should be there that's why jesus said told the disciple if you have faith say to this mountain be uprooted and thrown into the sea and it will certainly happen the mountain will come and will obey your command because you have prayed the same way if you pray and ask in the prayer that you already received god will certainly give it to you because you have already confessed that you have received it and if you are going to pray if you, if you want to forgive anybody else <laughs> forgive them then come and ask in the prayer father god will answer this is about the last uh, message given by lord god jesus christ to his disciples about faith so what about the faith life of you you stand fast in faith that means um, first corinthians 16 13 said be alert be firm in the christian faith be courage and strong that is very very important you continue in faith don't be discontinued that's what paul went all over iconia listira and all the places he he told the people be strong in faith continue in faith don't come out of the faith from the jesus christ in between continue in faith of jesus christ until you live in this world be strong in faith that is also very important because roman 420 says we abraham did not doubt god's promise out of lack of faith instead giving honor to god for the promise he have received and he became strong because of faith it like that way as abraham you should become strong because of faith and you have to uh, give honor to the god because of giving the promises hold on the promises with great faith be strong in faith and uh, let your promises be fulfilled by be, being strong in faith then abound in faith always you should be abound in faith abounding in faith is that don't live it have have it in your mind but what what faith you have in your mind your faith you have in the mind is that jesus is a um, is the messiah he died on the cross for your sin you accept him as a savior and you are living your life for, for serving the jesus christ and fulfill the um, grand commission in your life be grounded in faith what do you mean by you be grounded in faith colossian chapter 123 says you continue in faith without being moved from the solid foundation of hope that good news contains so you should be solid foundation whatever happen good thing happen maybe bad thing happen maybe your prayer answered sometime prayer won't be answered whatever may be the situation you should continue in the faith and not be moved from the solid foundation hold fast in faith always hold fast it don't leave it so in this this way you have to grow in faith in your christian life and so we saw today sunday triumph for entry into the jerusalem surveying the temple and return to bethany jesus christ returned to bethany and stayed there and on monday what happened again he came to he again he came back to uh, from bethany to jerusalem on the way he cursed the fig tree because it is a deceptive tree and then he went to temple there he cleansed the temple and there, there also there is uh, then the attraction of the sacrifice the, the greek people want to see jesus christ the greek speaking people but he illustrated about the death of uh, himself on the cross and after that he returned to bethany 
on the tuesday and returned back to from bethany to morning uh, from jerusalem on the way uh, the, uh, peter saw that was the jesus christ uh, the cursed fig tree was completely dried using that cursed fig tree which was completely dried jesus christ gave two uh, lessons first one as the fig tree dried up uh, the jewish nation the temple are going to be completely destroyed this happened in ad 70 and next one is a um, separate lesson to the disciple the lesson of faith um, the lesson of prayer the lesson of forgiveness um, all these things people have heard and they accepted it and not but least what's the memory we are safe john chapter 11 john chapter 12 verse 47 if anyone hears my word and does not follow them i don't condemn them i did not come to condemn the world but to save the world so let us hear the word of god and accept jesus as our savior if you are not going to if you are hearing the word of god and not doing going to fall now if not doing it and not following it that means the word what you have heard is going to condemn you at the end of the world god bless you amen